Once you get yourself an M1 Garand, you're going to want all the goodies and accessories that go along with it. How's it going guys? Welcome back to the Pilot Patriot channel. Today we're going to be talking about M1 Garand accessories and all the gear a soldier would have carried in World War II if they were carrying this rifle. Now for those of you that don't know, the M1 Garand was the standard issue rifle for the U.S. military from 1936 to 1957. So that's World War II and Korea and beyond. I have done a full in-depth video about the history and the features of this gun. I'll put a link to that right here at the top of the screen. So if you haven't seen that, you definitely want to make sure you check that out. And if you haven't done it yet, guys, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. Give us a thumbs up and hit that notification bell so you get notified every time we upload new videos. Now let's get right into it. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys. This gun right here can be very addicting, just like most other guns. Once you get yourself an M1 Garand, you're going to want all the goodies and accessories that go along with it. Now there are typically two types of M1 Garand owners. They're collectors and they're shooters. And of course, there's people that kind of meet in between there. And really, before you go out looking for these accessories and gear and stuff like that, you need to decide which one of those you are because it's going to make a big difference. For me, my rifle is a Springfield 1945, so it is a World War II period production. And so all the gear that I have here is stuff that could have been issued with this rifle. It's all World War II production stuff. Now, if that's not something that you care about, there are all types of reproduction gear that looks the same, it works the same, and really, it's really good stuff. So if you're interested in the reproduction stuff, you can get it brand new. So some of you may want to go that route. Either way, I'm gonna put as many links as I can to all of these things in the description below. So if you wanna get this stuff for yourself, make sure you go check those out. Now, let's just go right down the list. There are a couple things that you're gonna to have to have. The first is in-block clips. This gun works off of eight round in-block clips. And unless you wanna shoot it one round at a time, you're gonna need in-block clips. So make sure you go get a bunch of these. It's just like magazines. You're gonna want a bunch of them so you don't have to sit there on the range and reload them every time you want to shoot. And next, obviously, is ammo. So the, the M1 Grand shoots a 30 alt 6 And something that's important for you to know is that you can't just go pick up any 30 alt 6 off the shelf and shoot it in a, in a Grand. Now, I know there are going to be plenty of people who are like, yeah, you can do this and this, and if you get an aftermarket gas plug, you can do that. Really, I think the best and easiest way is to get Grand-specific ammo. And there are companies that make 30 alt 6 that is specifically made for the Grand. Now, what I typically get is the P PPU ammo and it actually says on the box for M1 Garand. Now you are going to want to make sure you do that so you don't cause any damage to your gun. Next is a sling. All M1 Garands were issued with some type of sling. You will see a mixture of leather and web slings used during World War II. But the one I have here is the web sling and it is dated 1945 right here on the bottom. Now, like I said, there's all types of reproductions and you can get Korean era slings, World War II era slings. But for me, I just wanted something that would be correct for the rifle. So I got 1945. These are really cool slings. Typically, uh, you see them like this, nice and tightened up close to the rifle. Uh, now, if you were going to sling this onto your back, there's a little adjustment here. You just pull that tab down, you pull that up retighten that tab and then you can sling it up around your shoulder the next thing you may want to get that would have come with your gun if you have an m1 garand you may be aware that right here on the buttstock there is a storage compartment what that storage compartment was for is for the cleaning kit you can see there's two compartments here and it's just a little trap door that opens up inside that compartment what you would find is an oiler bottle so on one end it has the oiler and as you can see i have put some gun oil in here on the other end inside of here is your m10 tool and that typically would have been wrapped up with some patches so that it's not jiggling around in there and causing a bunch of noise so this would have been in one hole and typically you would have had some more patches packed in behind it to keep it tight and with the cleaning kits you will see lots of different variations uh, different products different tools that would have been in there uh, and typically the way it worked out is whatever that unit had on hand, that's what they issued to you. So there is really no standard of what would have been in here, but most of them would have had that oiler bottle. And they would have had this little pouch here with your four sections of cleaning rod, your patch attachment for the end of the rod, 
and your bore brush. And all of that packs down in here tight into this pouch. And then that just pushes down into the other hole in the butt stock. And like I said, if there's extra room, you just pack it with extra patches for cleaning. Now, most of what you see out there for those is gonna be reproduction. And like I said, there's links in the description. But the one I have here is new old stock. So that means it was original production, but it was unused. And I found that at a website called Liberty Tree Collectors. And they have lots of other M1 Grand accessories as well. So you may wanna check them out. Next is your M1 bayonet. And really no Garand is complete without its bayonet. So the way that works is the loop here is gonna fit right around the barrel and the lug is gonna lock in here at the back of the handle and that locks it in tight. Now don't be worried if you do have a little bit of jiggling, that is normal. And then you have this little release button here on the bottom to pull it off of there. The bayonet I have here is a PAL production, 1943, and it is dated here on the bottom, PAL 1943. Now, originally this was an M1905 Type 2 bayonet. So the bayonets that fit on the Garands are the same design that were used with the 1903 Springfield. The difference is during World War I, they were 16 inches long instead of 10 inches. The same was true at the beginning of World War II. So in 41, 42, and 43, they did produce their bayonets at 16 inches long. In 1943, they decided to switch over to a 10 inch bayonet, same design, but 10 inches long on the blade. And what they did is they would cut these down to 10 inches for the new specifications. Now the way you can tell that is the blood groove here in the middle. You can see that it runs all the way to the tip of the blade. Typically on an M1 bayonet, uh, it would stop about here, but you can tell on the cut downs that it does run all the way to the edge and you can see obviously that it was cut down here. The same is true for the scabbard. Those were 16 inches long obviously and those were also cut down to 10 inches to accommodate the new length of the bayonet. Now most of the time right here, you will see the maker of your bayonet. Now there were several companies that made these bayonets, American Fork and Hoe, Oneida Limited, PAL, like this one here, uh, Union Fork and Hoe, Utica Cutlery, and Wild Tool. Now the Wild Tool uh, were the least produced and they never actually made a 10 inch bayonet. They only made the 16. Once they switched over to 10, they didn't make anymore. So those Wild Tool are some of the rarest and most expensive bayonets out there, followed by Oneida Limited and then PAL. And then the other companies made quite a few and those are a lot easier to find. Now there are a lot of reproductions and fakes out there. Uh, now there's nothing wrong with the reproduction if that's what you want, but if you want a real one, you need to make sure that you're getting a real one. Same thing with the scabbards. Uh, they are marked here with the flaming bomb and the US here in the middle of the bomb. And that bayonet just locks in place just like it does on the gun and you hit this release here to pull it out. Next thing we have here is the M1923 ammo belt. This is the belt that a soldier would have worn if he was carrying the M1 Garand. This one here is a 1942 made by RM Co. And you can see that right here. The maker's mark is usually stamped right here on the back. Now uh, you will see that in various conditions, this one is quite faded, but you can still make it out RM Co. On the front here, at least for the army editions, uh, they would have a US stamped here. And that may be in several different fonts, just depending on the maker of it. This one here is actually in really good condition. Uh, you can find these in all different types of conditions. And if you're looking for the M1923 ammo belt, something you wanna note is that most World War II production is gonna be in this khaki color. Now you will see some transitional ones where towards the end of World War II, they were using some khaki and some of the OD green uh, products when they were making these. You will see the transitional ones, but typically World War II is gonna be khaki. Most after World War II are gonna be the OD green. And the same goes for most of these other pouches and web gear as well. These pouches here do have a lift the dot snap on them, so it's really easy to snap and unsnap. And then that's gonna hold your in-block clips in there just like that. One interesting thing is that the design of the M1923 belt is very similar to the 1910 belt, which was used in World War I. And this belt actually will work with the stripper clips for a Springfield rifle as well. Most of them will have a strap here on the inside that snaps into this button here. And that's in there to hold 
those 10 round stripper clips for the Springfield rifle. Now in mine, the straps are there, but they've been cut off. And I don't know this for sure, but my thought is that that was probably done by whatever soldier was wearing this belt. If they were carrying in block clips in there, there's really not much need for that extra strap and it might've gotten in the way. So they probably just cut that off. Um, that's just my thought. Somebody in the comments below, let me know, does that make this less valuable? I'm not sure but uh, just be aware that some of them are gonna have that extra strap in there. Mine does not. And I'll just show you here how this belt would have attached together. You can see it has the little nub here on the back and it just clips in just like that right there. And that's gonna hold it on there nice and tight. These pouches are actually separate from the belt individual. And then the belt is run through in the back through these loops and then secure it here with these clips. Now on their ammo belt, you can see that they have all these grommets here at the bottom and that's to attach all the other various tools and components that they might have needed to carry with them. Uh, as you can see on mine, I have the first aid pouch here that is a 1942 made by Detroit Needle. And you can see that here on the back, it is stamped clearly Detroit Needle 1942. The same type of lift the dot closure. And in mine, I do have an original first aid kit. This is the Carlisle bandage type. It's a tin container. Uh, this one is actually unopened. I don't plan on opening it just to keep it authentic, but that is really cool. If you're looking for a first aid pouch, you may want to try to find one that comes with the original first aid kit included. If not, you can always buy that separately. Now, another thing that would have been attached to this belt is your canteen. Now this canteen pouch here uh, is stamped, but it's pretty much illegible. I can't read what's on there. But uh, if you open it up here, it's got the same lift the dot closures. Inside, you will find your canteen. This canteen is a 1945 made by the Volrith company. So this is original. And also down in there, and this is a little harder to get out, so bear with me, would be the canteen cup. This canteen cup was made by AGM Co. and it's also 1945. So that just fits in there just like that. And as you can see here on the back, all, all these tools, including the bayonet, have the belt attachment here on the back that just feeds into those grommets on the belt. Now it did take me quite some time to hunt down all these different components uh, because I wanted it to be very specific. I wanted the World War II khaki color. I wanted um, all of them to be dated if possible. And I wanted them to all be period correct for my Springfield 1945 M1 Garand. Like I said, if that's not important to you, there are uh, reproductions out there and I will put links in the description below to both reproductions and real stuff that you can find some of the best websites out there that I found to find M1 Garand gear and World War II gear. Now some great resources for you while you're looking for all this stuff to make sure that what you're getting is correct is just go out and pick you up an M1 Garand book. This is the M1 Garand 1936 to 1957 by Joe Poyer and Craig Reich. This is a great book. I have several by them for different antique rifles and stuff that I have. This book does tell a lot of the history of the gun, but then it goes part by part telling you how to identify the year that each part was made, how to identify um, whether all the parts on your rifle are correct. And then it also goes into the accessories, the belts um, extensively on bayonets and things like that. So uh, these books can be really great resources if you're wanting to research M1 Garand and all the accessories that would go with it. Um, and I'm also gonna put links to all those books down below. So make sure you check those out. Um, honestly, this book was invaluable to me while I was doing all this and researching my gun and everything. Now the M1 Garand is such an iconic rifle and all the gear that goes with it is just uh, so nostalgic. I love that I can hold these things and wear them when I'm out shooting my Garand. It really makes you think about the stories that could be told by each one of these different components and the soldiers that carried them in some of the most significant times of our country. So if this kind of stuff interests you guys, if you like this kind of stuff, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. Let me know in the description below if you wanna see more videos like this. I really enjoyed this type of stuff and this is really what got me into guns was antiques and gun collecting and things like that. 
So I really hope you like this video, guys. If you want to help support this channel, remember you can do that by following us on Patreon and Facebook. You can also visit pilotpatriotapparel.com for some really cool patriotic and Second Amendment t-shirts. Thanks for watching, guys. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Bye.